Namaste to all. I am Sheetal Shah, the Managing Director at the Hindu American Foundation. Today, I am joined by Fred Stella and Rishti May for a much requested follow-up conversation to the one they had at HAF's year-end gala, Unconventional Paths. Fred, Drishti, thank you both for agreeing to come back. We really appreciate it. Folks were completely riveted by your personal journeys to Hinduism, and there were many requests to hear, from, hear more from both of you. For anyone who is listening today but missed Fred and Drishti at our gala, a quick intro. Fred Stella was born and raised a Catholic. Through his own unconventional path, he discovered Hinduism many years ago, and today serves as the Pracharak for the West Michigan Hindu Temple. He also hosts a weekly radio program on religion and spirituality on his local NPR affiliate, and he is also a member of HAF's National Leadership Council. Drishti May was born and raised a Muslim. Through her own unconventional path, she discovered Hinduism, and today, serves as the president of the National Hindu Students Forum UK, the largest Hindu student movement outside of India. We heard about their paths to Hinduism at our year-end gala, and today we're here for more. We're going to start with a number of questions that we weren't able to take at the gala, and we'll see where that takes us. So getting started, why don't we start with you, Drishti? Can you tell me if the Muslim community was open to you moving to Hindu traditions? And if not, how did you find the courage to do what you did? Well, thank you. So namaste everyone. Um, real pleasure to be back um, on the HAF forum. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, so the question is, was the Muslim community open to me leaving Islam? Uh, short answer is no. Um, it's not something that was welcome, something that was generally spoken about, or even, you know, I guess a possibility in the worldview that I grew up with. So my only option um, at the age of 19 when I left was to leave secretly, you know, it was to literally pack two bags and leave home uh, and, and hope as much as I could that I would be okay. So quite a scary experience for me um, at that age. Um, when it comes to the question of courage, I think that there's a lot more nuance perhaps to, to the response that I ought to give. So I think, you know, the situation that I was in, you know, through my teenage years, I fundamentally don't believe was unique in any way. I think there must be hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Drishtis out there in the world. There might be other Muhammads and Abduls, you know, who also are questioning Islam, who don't resonate with the teachings that want, you know, a different life but they don't necessarily have um, other things in addition to the desperation to leave Islam. So first of all, I was desperate. I had desperation to leave Islam. The second thing that I was exposed to was a better world story, a better narrative, a better you know, alternative, something else to believe in. And for me, I think that came through my exposures to philosophy. So you know, from the ages of 15, 16, 17, studying philosophy at college, um, being able to read books that I was exposed to through my education system, and then later signing up for uh, a class that focused on both Greek and Hindu philosophy, where we studied the Mahabharata, were huge fundamental blocks for me, you know, to, to provide a different story um, to the world, a different story to truth, reality, you know, that what I was experiencing. And then the third part that I think really does unlock the ability to leave is when a young person leaves Islam, who will embrace them? Who will accept them? You know, where is the community on the other side? And I think that's where I got very, very lucky. You know, um, I was thinking about this the other day and it's, you, you could liken it to jumping out of an aeroplane you wouldn't jump out of an airplane without a parachute, right? You'd want some sort of safety net. And so leaving Islam can feel a lot like that. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, there, there, there could be um, danger either way. What do you choose? Do you choose what you already know or do you choose something unknown? And I think where I got lucky was that I found a parachute mid-fall. 
And that for me really was the community, you know? Um, I was 19. I didn't think far, further beyond uh, calling the authorities just to say, I'm not a missing person, please just keep me safe. It was the community that, you know, um, helped me change my name. They helped me change and forge a new identity. They helped me, uh, you know, not only find work, but find places to stay so that I could move, you know, for several weeks, just so that I could disappear essentially. Um, and so if we talk about courage, I'd say the courage lies with the community, the Hindu community. Um, you know, it's my leaving is a consequence of the courage that they showed, um, to be honest. Thank you. That's, um, that's incredible. And I want to give Fred a chance to speak, but what you actually just said segued really beautifully into another question that someone had asked was about your circles of support. When you went through this discovery and this transition, who were your circles of support and ha you know, have they remained the same today? Has it grown? Has it changed? Maybe you could, since you had already started, you could go ahead and, and speak to that and then we can hear Fred's story. Sure. Um, so circles of support. So I think for me, it started off with a group of friends um, from the Hindu community that prior to my leaving Islam, prior to, you know, um, while I was still wearing the hijab, actually, would be really open to meeting my criticisms or meeting my questions, meeting my, um, my inquiry with warmth and acceptance. I think that's where it started. You know, there wasn't a defensiveness, there wasn't um, ridicule. There also wasn't a case of actually, you know, there's a limit to what you can say. There was a lot of acceptance. And so it started off with a group of young Hindus who were confident in who they were, that could embrace dialogue and helped me with my own exploration, with, you know, with no dogma, with no prescription, very much just a lot of room. And that circle, I guess, stayed for me as a constant, as a base whilst I went away to university. It became, you know, my friends literally became my family. And in there, I've been really, really lucky, I would say, because not only did I have and do I have a really good, strong circle of friends, you know, I've been so fortunate that I've been literally adopted. I have, you know, two wonderful human beings that I call mum and dad. Uh, so now they're my adopted family, but we share an incredible bond. And we spoke about courage, we speak about support. You know, if I'm honest, you know, they're, they're very simple people. You know, they aren't necessarily educated to the level that you and I are or to some of the listeners or the audience uh, would be that are tuning in today. Yet what I think what they've done is extraordinary. You know, they had so many things around them that would have put any individual off, you know, what will the community say? What would the backlash of the Muslim community be? You know, um, they had their own scars from their memories and their parents' memories of partition. Yet in each of those, they met it with their own form of courage, with their own form of acceptance to say, here is a young girl that we will embrace, that we will make our own. And I think that's extraordinary. And it's, you know, that's the foundation that I build upon and that I give my work upon. But honestly, um, yeah, they, their, their courage, their acceptance and their love and their ability to live Hindu values is, I think, an inspiration for me and my biggest support. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And it's so wonderful that you've actually found that. I'm sure it's, it's obviously made what is a very challenging journey, somewhat more sim uh, smoother. Um, Fred, why don't you tell us a little bit more about moving from the Catholic community to the Hindu community? How was that viewed uh, within your community, your family and the broader community? Uh, and what sorts, of, what sorts of support circles did you have as you were going through this phase of discovery? My story is so much different than Dristi's. I, I honor her and admire her so much because hers was a significant trial. Mine was not. When you say, 
how did this community or that community respond? Well, Drishti was a part of a very insulated uh, Muslim community, uh, right? The people who were in your life were religious Muslims by and large. I had a vast community made up of Roman Catholics, Protestants, Jews, people who had no faith whatsoever. And not having that insulated community that is always concerned about, is he going to stay? Is he going to go? I, I simply do not have that experience. Um, now, I mentioned the last time that when I was 15 years old and my parents discovered that I was interested in Hinduism, they were certainly uh, more than little concerned. Um, but as I, I also mentioned that I just went underground and I, I would tell them a lie about where I was going and go to the temple. All of my friends were lying to their parents, but they were lying to their parents about smoking pot. I was lying to my parents about going to the Hindu temple. Uh, and, and then there was nothing there, meaning to say, uh, uh, I did not share my spiritual journey with my parents. I shared it with a few friends. And by the time I actually took initiation in, in, in Guru Diksha, I was in my early 30s and I, you know, I was an adult. And he, this is also important. In the more progressive Christian communities in the 1970s, there was a tremendous amount of experimentation in Eastern philosophy. It wasn't considered uh, horrible. Now, if you were a part of, say, an evangelical or a Pentecostal group, yes, that, that'd be a different story. But in Catholicism, uh, the Catholics had already experienced uh, the Second Vatican Council in the, in the mid-60s. And one of the directives of the Vatican Council is that Catholics should look to the beauty and truth in other religions. I mean, that was revolutionary. Look for the beauty and truth without denying the truth with a capital T that the Catholic Church offered. They could still look at, say, Hinduism and see the Bhakti movement and say, well, that is absolutely wonderful. Uh, they could see the, the, uh, the self-discipline that is encouraged, the morality and ethics. And they would say, that is absolutely fine. So there was a little bit more wiggle room in there. And so uh, I, I did not have a, a major divorce. Let, let's call it that. Now, as far as the uh, community, the Hindu community supporting me, um, I had the local chapter of Self-Realization Fellowship. I mentioned that that is the Sampradai that uh, I identify with. Uh, and as I was studying and I, as I was taking up meditation, uh, they became my friends. Uh, and of course, there was no pressure whatsoever to move this way or that way. But when I was moving in that direction, they were certainly there to help here in the local chapter in Grand Rapids. And then there was also the uh, uh, mainstream, more orthodox Hindu community. We didn't have a temple then, but we did have a community. And so there was certainly support from them. They were absolutely wonderful and welcoming. Uh, and again, anybody who is Hindu who is watching this knows that there was certainly no pressure to self-identify one way or the other. I, I could have maintained my Catholic identity, I think, and still been as embraced as I, as I was when I decided that uh, I really was a Hindu. Let me the ask you challenge, I will say this, I will say this, uh, uh, if I may. Sure. Uh, the biggest challenge with the Indian Orthodox Hindu community, they welcomed me, they embraced me, um, and they certainly acknowledge me. Obviously, I have this, uh, this uh, position with the temple. But quite frankly, there's one issue that has never been resolved, and I hope someday it is. Whenever I am at a, a, a Hindu Indian function, they're always so concerned that the food is going to be too hot for me. And you know what? It isn't. Okay. Can I say this for the record? It isn't. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Well, I, you know, where I was going with this um, was that oftentimes um, people who are of non-Indian descent who consider them, themselves Hindu have different experiences with the Indian Hindu community. Yours obviously sounds like it was very positive. Uh, but, you know, for example, I know folks who, because of the color of their skin, were not allowed to, to enter a temple. Now we're talking about in India, not here. But, you know, in your, in your travels as a Hindu, have you ever experienced anything like that? Or have you generally found it to be a welcoming community? Um, in all of the uh, countries that I have visited, and, and of course, the United States where I live, uh, absolutely. Uh, I've traveled a fair amount in India. Um, I was on a lecture tour there in 2005. I've visited multiple Hindu communities and temples. I've never had anyone try to tell me that I was something other than what I self-identify as. Uh, nothing, not at all. In all of the years, the only challenge I had was um, uh, I had a piece I had a piece that I wrote for Hinduism today, and I got a personal email after that piece was published, and someone uh, challenged me that I did not change my name, and that is that is the only example of someone who had that issue with me that that you know I have a Christian name. And no one else has, when I joined HAF, I know you folks didn't say, well, we can't have a Fred on our <laughs> council. <laughs> um, I did find out I do have the, the Sanskrit uh, version of Frederick is Shantiraj. So if somebody wants a hin an Indian name, I've got one. It's just, it's just the Sanskrit for Shantiraj, peaceful king. <laughs> That you are, Fred. Um, so I want to transition topics just a little bit, uh, taking on yet another question that someone had asked the gala. Uh, Drishti, I'll start with you. Um, the, the question was, how is the symbolism of idols or places justified in Abrahamic faiths? Or is that completely taboo? So for example, um, for Fred, perhaps the, the cross, uh, or for Drishti going to Mecca, where you're circling a sacred building or stone. Uh, to some Hindus, they would say this is perhaps a form of Murti Puja, so to speak. Um, how is that? How is that addressed within the community? Sure. Um, so I think before we approach this question, I think like the first thing, um, and you know, I'll, I'll reference what we said at the gala as well is it's really, really important that we get our language and our definitions clear from the off, right? So Hindus are not idolatry, uh, you know, idolatrous. They do not worship idols. Why? Because idols, the word idol means, or idolatry means the worship of false images. We as Hindus do not worship false images, right? Um, and, you know, I think, the irony of the statement is, is anyone who calls you or a Hindu an idolatry to is probably committing idolatry themselves because they've created a false image. So I think that's, you know, first and foremost, I think the most important thing uh, to get out there. Um, then if we were to answer the second part of the question, is this a form of Murti Puja? We, we have to be really clear on what is a Murti. Um, and so, look, I, I'm not a scholar, uh, you know, I, I've not uh, delved in extremely deep or, you know, done any significant study here, but I'll give my best attempt at a definition. So with the murti, whatever material it's made out of, be that metal, clay, mud, um, stone, whatever that is, it is something, it is a, it is, um, a statue of that, of that material that is made sacred. It is made sacred through a ceremony, where you know, it is given the spirit or the prana of the deity, of the values that are embodied by the deity or the Bhagavan, which it represents, right? And there is a ceremony, a consecration ceremony for this to occur. So it is literally made uh, sacred. It's not, not, it's not just um, a statue 
You know, it's more than a symbol. It's more than a symbol. So coming to your question then, once we've defined this is, is there something equivalent in Christianity and Islam, the Abrahamic traditions? Um, I would say, yes, there is. So you know, within churches, we see altars and crosses, and sure, I'm sure Fred can touch on this, you know, that are consecrated. They are made holy. They are meant to literally carry the spirit of Christ. In Islam, what we see, and this is rather interesting, is that we see land that is consecrated. So you have a distinction between um, a masjid and an imam bara. So a masjid is consecrated land. It can never be destroyed. It can never be moved. If a mosque is built, if a masjid is built, it will always be built there. If a, 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 and there is a punishment, I guess, associated with that. Whereas with an imam bara, it is not consecrated to that same extent. The interesting fact, and the reason why I know this, is because women were not allowed inside the masjid when they were on their period. So in the UK, the way around it is you build the masjid where men can go, and then you build an imam bara, and you don't consecrate that land, and that's where women would go for their sermons, so on and so forth. So, you know, with those definitions, I'd say, yes, we, we have something, um, but, but I think we need to be very, very clear on our terminology. You know, Hindus are not idolatrous, uh, idolatrous sorry. Um, and I think we must be really confident in resisting this pigeonholing that happens, you know, by whomever it is, whether it's within the Hindu community or outside of it, be really, really clear. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, I think um, this term of idol, I think when kind of that first wave of Hindus were coming abroad, right? And they were trying to find ways to describe what they were doing and describe their tradition. This happened to be the word that came up. And I think back in that time, that connotation of what is associated with idol perhaps didn't exist or they weren't made aware of it. But this is clearly something, you know, there's a growing awareness of what it means to worship an idol. And even at, at HAF, we've certainly moved away from, from the term idol and we just actually just use Murthy. Um, and it, and it, I think it, it works out better, but I think it's, it's taking a while for the entire community to kind of transition over and understand really what does idol mean to, you know, someone of an Abrahamic uh, faith. So, um, Fred, I'm sure you have something to say about this um, from the Catholic perspective. Yes, uh, of course, in Christianity, there are many stripes and how, uh, I'll use the term sacred artifacts for right now, how they are treated and how they're looked upon can vary widely. So if you are a part of the Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, portion of Christianity, that branch, or Roman Catholicism, you do consecrate material objects and make them holy, similar to what happens in Hinduism. You have statues, you have icons, uh, you have rosaries, uh, just about anything can be consecrated and it becomes sacred. In Protestantism, uh, one of the differences between going to a Protestant church and a Catholic or Orthodox church is that in a, in a Protestant church, most likely you're going to see a bare cross. You're not going to see the corpse of Jesus on that cross. That's the difference between a cross which is just two pieces of wood that intersect, and a crucifix. A crucifix has the corpse on it. And uh, Protestants do not have that uh, in their churches, by and large. I think may maybe Episcopalians or Anglicans do. But, but uh, other than that, you're, you're, you're not going to see that. And there are some churches where you will not even see any image of Jesus. That is considered idolatry to them. Uh, I was in a church recently, and they had all of these stained glasses as uh, windows, as you would expect in a lot of churches. And all of them were from biblical scenes that I could easily identify. There's Adam and Eve, uh, there's uh, Noah and all of this. And they even had uh, portions from the gospel, where Jesus, of course, is the main figure, but Jesus was never a part of the scene in 
the stained glass. You know, his apostles were or something else, but not Jesus. They will not even, uh, uh, the, the most they will do sometimes is if they do a film and Jesus is in the film, they'll, they'll show a shadow. And that's as close as they get. So some stripes of Protestantism are very, very strict on that. I, I have the same issue when I give people tours of the uh, Hindu temple, explaining what a murti is. And I agree that murti is the best word. Uh, it is a challenge because, yes, there are people from, uh, who are first generation Indian Americans who use the term idol. And I, I do my best <laughs> to counter that. And I, I give the exact same explana explanation that Drishti does, that, 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 that this is not a false image. And we understand that this is wood or marble or, or whatnot, uh, whatever the, the material is. We understand that we are venerating something beyond what is in front of our eyes, but it is acting uh, uh, as a transmitter of our love and devotion. Um, so, yes, that I, I continue to have that conversation with people. Yeah, and the Murthy is also, you know, another purpose is they, they allow us to focus, right? It allows you to focus when, when you want to spend that time with the divine. It's a little bit challenging to try to, you know, envision Brahman <laughs> and be one with Brahman, at least for us average human beings. But the Murthy provides you with some image where you can then focus and you can hold that Im image in your mind, even that, when you close your eyes. That, so that I mean, is, it serves that, many purposes. That, that is exactly, exactly what I, what I tell them. And, uh, you know, sometimes because I bring a lot of church groups into the into the temple and you can tell the difference between the Catholics and the Protestants by how they react to the Mortis. Um, because uh, usually the Catholics are much more favorable towards that. They wanna know where they get the extra arms, uh, but uh, they, nonetheless, they're, uh, they're interested and, and they kind of get it. They get uh, how you can really focus your attention on an image of some kind. So moving on to another question, and again, veering off to another slightly slightly different direction. Um, Drishti, let's start with you again. How do you see Hindu relations with Muslims from kind of a social, political, theological perspective? Do you see, you know, one of the things that many of us within Hinduism really appreciate is the fact that it's pluralistic, that there are many different paths to reaching the divine. Do you see any uh, movement towards or any acceptance of pluralism or uh, movement in that direction uh, within the Muslim community? And I realize that I am kind of pigeonholing everybody in the Muslim community into one big lump sum, which isn't necessarily accurate, but Hopefully you can do the question some justice. So um, I'm gonna try and answer this in two parts because I think there's um, an experience part and then you know, answer the latter part, which is, are we moving in a pluralistic direction? Um, so, so I guess when you ask this question, two things come to mind, right? And um, yeah, so growing up in Islam, you know, up until, um, I'd say about the age of 18, you know, going into madrasa, going into um, different sermons, you know, majlises, etc. Um, it was very clear what the view of Hindus was in my community and in my textbooks. It was very, very clear, right? And that is that Hindus and Indians are backwards and impure to the extent um, that you know, that najasa, that impurity could be transferred. So if I had an interaction with a Hindu whereby there were certain conditions met and I was touched or, you know, there was some sort of interaction, my prayers would only be accepted after I'd done um, a certain washing ritual, a ghusl, right? There'd be certain situations whereby if I'd eaten something prepared by a Hindu, 
my prayers wouldn't be answered for three days until my body was clean again internally. So that isn't something that's cultural. It's not something that exists only within one Muslim community. That is something that is there, it is written, it is referenced, you know, there, there are lots of people that will resonate with, with this. So but, like, that's an experience that I think, you know, we'll have to put an underline below. below. The second thing, and you know, this is like, please allow me to tell you categorically that India is looked down upon, right? Um, I recently in the last few years did a DNA test um, and I know that I am absolutely 100% Indian. Like there's nothing fancy going on in my family history. But, or yet, um, I went well into my teens thinking that I am African, not Indian. Crazy. That is what I was taught to believe. That is what my family had grown up thinking. You know, my father was very adamant that we are not Indian. His, grand his parents were from India, but he'd grown up in Africa, so we were African. Saying that now, I can laugh at it, but that prejudice and that lack of pride, that lack of confidence and identity, I think was very telling. And that was something that was shared, not just in my family, but wider as well. So I think, you know, let, let, let's just put that there. That, that's a lived experience. And now let's contrast it to the experience within the Hindu community. Now, I've been part and parcel of the Hindu community for about a decade, right? And in that, what are the values that we grow up with? What are the values we teach our kids? So, you know, God is everywhere and for everyone quite a universal value. Um, my favorite, all religions are equal. There are multiple paths to the truth and all are equal in the pursuit of truth, right? So, so these are values that the Hindu community treasures and they put forward and that's how they enter dialogue, right? And I think, you know, I, I speak for, you know, the experience that I've had with the Muslim community, but also, you know, Fred, you may resonate with this from the Christian perspective, that the Abrahamic religions, these belief systems, start from a premise of we have an exclusive claim to the truth. Whereas a Hindu will not have that. The Hindu will say there are multiple paths to truth. I am on a journey. And so when we come to a dialogue, whether that's a theological dialogue, whether that's, you know, philosophical, if it's a social interaction or even a political interaction, the starting points are very different. So how are you going to have an equal footing or an equal dialogue, you know? And I think if I can be blunt and if I can, you know, yeah, be open here, um, I think when pursuing these relations, we as a Hindu community are quite naive. You know, we, we don't appreciate this difference in a starting point. We come to these dialogues expecting equality, expecting acceptance because we give it. And that is simply not the case, you know. Um, unless we as the Hindu community, you know, have the courage, but also the determination to change how we educate our young people, you know, how we communicate and what we articulate, um, unless we do this differently, I think this is going to remain largely a one-way dialogue. You know, uh, it's not going to be truly two-way. It's not going to be truly equal with any meaning. Um, and so concepts like, um, you know, modernity, progress, piety, morality, these are going to be defined for us by the other. It won't be something where we, where we can give an authentic, narrative or an authentic definition of our own. Um, it's exactly, you know, that's exactly what's happened for the, the last five centuries. And I think the question that we must ask ourselves as the Hindu community is, is this the world that we want to live in? And is this the world that we want to build? You know, I know I certainly don't. So, so I think that's really important to, to underline and be really clear on. Um, now, there was a second part that I said I'd come back to, which is, are we moving towards a plural direction? So having said what we've just said, um, will Christianity and Islam, and I guess if you were pointing to Islam in particular, um, be able to become plural? So, you know, from what I know, I think there are people who want to reform these Abrahamic traditions. There are people that want to reform Islam. There are people that want a more plural brought tradition. But I think we'd be amiss not to recognize our role here. 
right? Um, for thousands of years, um, we've had a plural tradition. We, you know, we, we have that inbuilt into our culture. And so if Islam or any other religion is going to become plural, it can't and it won't really happen independently. It does need some help. It does need, you know, some support. And I think this is where we have um, a role to play, you know, as ambassadors of pluralism, as, you know, people who understand and live the Hurma, we have a duty to not only understand that inner lived experience, but to be able to articulate it in a non-threatening way, in a non-dogmatic way, in a very accepting way, so that these ideas can, you know, not just be within our community, but, you know, permeate and also be adapted and remodeled for religions like Islam that may want to embrace or move towards a pluralistic direction. So, um, so I think that the, the, the response to that question is we have a role to play as Hindus, as people who understand and live a pluralistic lifestyle, you know, a plural philosophy. If we, if we want to see that movement, we have to step up to the plate. Absolutely. And I, you know, I kind of want to go back a couple steps to your first part of the question um, about the, the things that Hindus teach their children and this line about all religions are equal. It's so funny you said that because growing up, I, I used to hear that, but I would hear it from other community members, not from my, my own parents, particularly my father, who would say the reason people say this is because they have not studied all religions. Once you have studied all faiths, you will realize that they're not all equal because like you said, they don't start with the same premise. They're different premises that are going on. And so, you know, he's like, within the Hindu community, I would say one of the things that we need to do better when we're engaging in interfaith dialogue, for example, and Fred, I know you can, you can speak to this because you do this so often, is have a better understanding of the traditions that we are engaging with. And I think then we'll be going in perhaps on the same same foot. But Fred, I mean, you host an interfaith dialogue um, on your radio show. So maybe you could shed some light in, in your thoughts on this. Well, it's interesting because uh, right now, or really for the past uh, decade, I've seen a, a very robust conversation within the Hindu community on this idea of uh, what is called uh, radical universalism, uh, the idea that all religions are equal. And I think that what we need to do is really understand what that means. Uh, when we say all religions are, um, uh, can be good, all religions can uh, ultimately find the truth, there's a few ways to, uh, to attack that. Um, number one, uh, this, I say number one, this is in no real order. It's uh, how it comes into my head. Um, when you do compare the mystical branches of many of the religions, you do find more common ground. When I am with my Jewish friends who are practitioners of Kabbalah, when I'm with my Muslim friends who are dedicated Sufis, uh, my Christian friends who... Uh, take a more mystical or Gnostic view of Christianity, there's very little to argue about. It, it, I, I feel like I'm with Hindus, quite frankly. But we know that the vast majority of practitioners of those faiths are not on any sort of mystical marga. Uh, they practice mainstream, uh, what we would call creedal, like creedal Christianity, meaning that you, you pretty much abide by orthodoxy. And uh, there, it's, it's very clear that the religions are different. What I do say is that, uh, uh, let's say, a very, very devout, good Muslim, uh, good the way we would define it, someone who has a, a wonderful relationship with the divine, someone who is compassionate and empathetic and giving, um, and then you compare that to a Hindu who maybe goes to Temple on Diwali and uh, that's about it and not a very good person. The, the, the Muslim that I'm describing is going to 
achieve a higher sense of self-realization uh, in, in that lifetime than the Hindu. Whereas a lot of other religions would say, no, it's the religion that you're in that trumps anything that you are, right? So, so there are many Christians that would say that a, a bad Christian is better than a good Hindu. Uh, not, not everyone, not everyone, but clearly um, there, there is that uh, mindset in some, uh, some stripes of Christianity, unfortunately. Then I'll tell you what I've really found uh, in my years with the Interfaith Connection is so many, particularly Christians, not Muslims, but particularly Christians who are really drawn to our philosophy and they can't explain it, meaning, meaning they have already assented that Jesus Christ is the unique expression of divinity in the flesh, that there, there can be no other. They, uh, they acknowledge baptism, they acknowledge the resurrection of the body, they, 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 they do all of that, but they still find so much beauty when they hear it explained or when they read it explained, and there is this attraction, they can't quite put the two of them together. Um, and th that's a journey that they have to take. I can't, I can't help them. But I've had so many people in, in my life, especially after a presentation, raise their hand and go, so can I be Catholic and Hindu at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> and I know there are people who would say yes, but I think that that's fraudulent. Uh, uh, no, you you cannot accept the uh, the concept of a physical resurrection that you will be maintained in the body you're in now forever with our understanding of samsara and moksha. You you, you just you just can't. And also the, the concept that there uh, is, is one expression of divinity as, as uh, Jesus is uh, to the Christians. So I find myself in many wonderful conversations with people. And again, just the fact that, that they're conflicted makes me, I, I appreciate that. They haven't come up with the answer at, at, at this time. I, I know Christians who are dedicated monists. And I don't understand how you can be a Christian and a monist. And I've gotten in conversations with them and the, the, the conversation just becomes sort of circular and they're not able to give me a, a, an answer that I think is logically sound. But you know what? I'm not gonna try to talk them out of it. Okay. Great. Well, I'm going to wrap up with one last question that I think is more of an uplifting question. Um, ironically, this, you didn't use this term at all in this conversation, but apparently at the gala, both of you used dharma very frequently. And so the last question that we'll touch base on here is, how do you define dharma? What does it mean to you? Um, and then if there's anything else you want to add on to there, please feel free. So why don't we start with you, Fred, this time? Wow. I think I, I, think I deserve to get my salary doubled for this, for, for that question. <laughs> uh, certainly, Dharma has several different definitions. Dharma is the way of the universe. It is the way, the Sanatana Dharma. Um, it is duty. So I use Dharma uh, many different ways. Uh, certainly, uh, so for instance, one of, one of my affirmations uh, that I use in meditation is, may I fulfill my Dharma with the gifts I have been given. So what that means is that I believe that there is a particular direction in my life. I believe that I have been gifted uh, with certain abilities, and I need to focus those abilities on fulfilling my dharma. That is my duty. Now, I can expand that to uh, think 
beyond my personal duty to the greater community, the Dharmic community. And I can, so, so that means that I'm, I'm talking about fulfilling my Dharma, my personal Dharma. And in, in that way, aiding the, the Dharma in, in, as in Sanatana Dharma, as in Hinduism, aiding my community with whatever abilities I may have, meager as they are, and then I can expand it to the actual way of the universe. That is to say, to help the whole of, of creation with whatever abilities I have. You know, so you start small and you simply expand. Um, I do use that phrase a great deal in my, in my um, uh, talks, my lectures, my, my temple tours with people, because I just think that Dharma is absolutely central to this thing we call Hinduism in all of its expressions. Rishti? I'm going to have to echo Fred and say, wow. Um, I'm going to caveat this response and say, I'm not an expert. And, you know, I think to even get close, it would require something short of 10 PhDs, you know, something much more than I can give in this lifestyle, but in this lifetime, sorry. Um, but here we go. So dharma, and I, and I won't touch upon, you know, some of the definitions that Fred has given. I thought that was rather beautiful. Um, but dharma you know, in the Brahma Sutras is equated to Satya, the absolute truth, the absolute reality, being distinct from relative truth and relative reality, that which you and I experience. Um, and there it is broken down further into three principles, heat, meat, and breath. So heat is that which is beneficial to all or as many people, meat that which reduces or minimizes harm, and breath that it, which is loving and compassionate in nature, right? And so I think when we internalize these principles and start to live by them and start to apply them in our lives, we then start to have actions within our lives um, that will either lead to the creation of punya or to the creation of bhapan. And let's define our terms again, right? So punya is anything that takes us closer to a state of mind where we are free of the glaciers, the vices, so anger, greed, jealousy, we're free of them. And they take us closer to the state of um, abudhaya, so where we are flourishing mentally, physically, spiritually. And conversely, papam is where we enter a state of mind where, or where the state of mind falls from punya. Right, where we are where we are falling into the vices, we are falling into the glaciers, and we are confusing um, relative truth that we experience for absolute truth. So when that confusion emerges, we have fallen into bhakti. I think you know, I find that really beautiful. Um, but again, we internalize this from heat meat breath to actions that give rise to punya and bhakti. And so, you know, the web of karma. Um, and we've introduced this concept of flourishing, flourishing in all senses. And, you know, Fred touched upon duty, and I think this is where duty rises. If you and I are flourishing and we are, you know, expanding our potential, realizing our potential as human beings, we're going to be net contributors to society. How? Because we are going to increase our capabilities. Our capabilities are made up of our skills and the values that form our character. If these grow and these are enhanced, um, you know, our capabilities increase. And to quote uh, Jiddu Krishnamurthy, you are responsible when you have the ability to respond. So as we increase our capabilities, we increase our ability to respond, we increase our responsibility, we arrive at duty. And so that for me is the chain of going from dharma to duty. But I think it's such a, you know, contrasting it to some of the things that we've touched upon in this webinar, in this record, uh, in this Zoom call, um, that is so beautiful. You know, what a beautiful worldview when you can take, you know, in one of its manifestations, dharma to mean this. It's a completely different paradigm. Um, you know, something that personally has enabled me so much, you know, just to be here to pursue dharma 
um, has been such a beautiful journey. Yeah, you know, this um, this reminds me of a really fascinating talk I heard by um, uh, Professor Vishwa Adlori Fred. I don't know if you're familiar with him, um, but he teaches here in New York, and he gave that he is like an expert on the Mahabharat, and he gave a fantastic talk here in New York at, at the Strand Bookstore about these this paradigm, the paradigm that the Mahabharat or Hinduism teaches, and then the paradigm that the Abrahamic traditions teach and the ecological impact of those two paradigms. So he talked about how from the Abrahamic perspective, man is made in the image of God, right? So if you're made in the image of God, you almost own that power, right? You have that power and you have those rights, right? Man dominates the world, man dominates animals, all other life. The Mahabharata, perspective or the Hindu perspective, which both of you have illuminated, is dharma. So dharma speaks to what is my duty? What are my responsibilities to those around me and to help the world, universe, you know, around me? And so he talked about how over the course of time, the shift in paradigms has weighted towards more of an Abrahamic perspective. And because it's all about my rights, that's how we viewed everything in the world. It's my resources to use because I am made in the image of God. And so he presents this as one of the reasons why we are in this really challenging period of climate change um, and you know, ecological destruction that's taking place is because the dharmic paradigm has largely been lost. That makes a great deal of sense. Yeah, it was, it's really fascinating. You were not English, so I don't know if you've, if you've heard his lecture, but um, it's on YouTube and I highly recommend it. And it speaks very much to what you both were talking about. Dharma as a sense of duty, not just to yourself, but to all of life. Absolutely. Well, I thank you both. Is there anything else that you felt like we haven't covered between our gala and today's talk? Any last thoughts that you wanted to share? Only that it's really been an honor and a privilege to be in a forum like this, a forum like this especially with Dristi. I, I uh, have a great deal of admiration for her simply because, as I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, her path to the Dharma was significantly more challenging than mine. And that uh, I, I, I consider myself fortunate that I grew up in a culture that allowed me to make a transition uh, without the personal cost. And I know that I know uh, some of uh, my friends who come from a more fundamentalist Christian background, they did have similar challenges, not not like Drishti's, I don't think, but but similar. So one final thought from me that I think, I, I don't think I've uh, fully done it justice, I guess, uh, when you asked one of your earlier questions, um, when we were talking about circles of support. And I think it'd be amiss not to acknowledge how truly wonderful the Hindu community has been, you know, in, in my journey, you know, from a few individuals at the start to how by and large the Hindu Samaj has just embraced me and my journey, you know, a, a real testament. And I think, you know, having seen um, what has been given in this life, you know, what really stands out to me is when we talk about duty, when we talk about dharma, it's that first step. It's that first step to say, I'm going to live this. Not necessarily I'm going to follow, but I'm going to live this. And, you know, the reason why, you know, I spoke of such admiration for my parents is because despite all the material odds that, you know, we may say are against them, they stepped up. And that was dharma in action. That was leadership. And what I find beautiful in, you know, Fred's journey and my journey and so many others is there's always been someone that has been led and guided by dharma to say, you know what? this is the right thing to do. This is my duty. This is a human being that has, you know, potential divinity within them. Let's allow whatever to be expressed to be expressed. 
Um, and I, I think that's so inspiring where we can accept that inquiry, we can accept people, you know, as rough, as polished as whoever they are, we see that potentiality, we see that divinity within them. And, you know, my only hope is that we can become more confident in owning this and really embrace um, how dharma can manifest in this way to, you know, help more who want to explore it. Um, so really thankful that we're able to have this conversation, you know, um, and, uh, you know, to have this dialogue that hopefully will be around for a while, but may help others who are curious and wish to explore uh, dharma and dharmic thought further. Um, so real pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you both, really appreciate it. You know, like our, our gala said, it's an, it's an unconventional path, but for so many of us who are born into it, um, sometimes it's easy to take it for granted. And so it's always such an honor and a pleasure to hear from people who have, you know, particularly you Drishti in terms of such a challenging journey, but Fred from somebody who just, you know, was like, this current path is not working for me. I need to figure something out. And I think that it's, you know, hopefully those of us who have been, who have been born into this tradition will regain some inspiration for how beautiful it is and how welcoming it is to, to everyone. Yeah, so again, I, I, oh, sure. Oh, just uh, when, when I really did uh, uh, fall in feet first in this wonderful tradition. Of course, in my naivete, uh, I just assumed anybody who had a name like Sheetal or Drishti uh, or Krishna must be on the same level I am. So I'd meet someone and want to talk about the Gita and be met with kind of a blank stare. <laughs> As I, oh, really? You're not all like that, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we're not all like that, friend. <laughs> like, you could probably still teach me a thing or two, I'm sure. <laughs> no, I, I, but I, I'm talking about people who, uh, they, they have no knowledge or are very, very little knowledge, very little. Like, like when I would go to our local Diwali celebration here in Grand Rapids. Obviously, that's going to bring out a lot of people for whom this is their only real expression of Hinduism. So yes, I would meet somebody and their, their name would be Krishna or Ram or something or other. I'm very, very new to this. And I'm just assuming that they take this seriously as I do. And some of them do, some of them don't. That, that's what I learned. I'd say that's probably apt in most in most communities. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right, both of you, we really appreciate it. Thanks again for joining us. And I'm sure we will see both of you in the near future. Well, definitely you, Fred, since you know you're part of the HAF team. And Drishti, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about what you're doing with the Hindu students and in the UK. For sure. For sure. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.